New York and on the new Hot 97 app, Ebro in the Morning. On Hot 97. Ebro in the Morning, beautiful Laura Styles, Rosenberg. Give it up for Larie Daniel Favors on the program. Like, literally, my family is on the program, and literally... <laughs> Why do you have to say literally when it's almost accurate, but you could have gone, literally, my friend? Well, because she's more than my friend. Whoa, what are you trying to say? Meaning she's my, like, best friend's wife. Ah, so it's family so address. Family, Meaning, like, family. she could call me and be like, yo, my man, check this out. You fucking up, straighten it out. And I'd have to be like, yo, you right, know right, 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 right. Yeah, I, I don't it. know that I would ever use those words in that way, but I'm... <laughs> <laughs> it's possible. Though. It's possible. It's possible. Um, we, I've spent many years uh, with Larie on Kwanzaa. Yes. Um, her husband is somebody I've known since high school. We were in the R&B group together. Tomorrow's oh, answer. Oh, my goodness. goodness. We got pictures to prove it. Yeah, tomorrow's yeah. answer. Yes. That's right. Yes, Great indeed. group. Yes. Really tell underrated group. Yo, would you Very tell much them we, so. I mean, they had moves. They had routines. And I yet mean, you feel like no one talks about them. It's, it's not right. It's a shame. Yeah. It's a shame. Yeah. All the great <laughs> music. <laughs> I need to all see the more music. All the great artists. You know, they just, you know. Yo, they isn't there a BET Unsung coming There is. There is. There is. Behind the music. Behind all that. Yo, we inspired a generation. That's right. I know, I know. Mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. Larie is here because um, you are working with the Census 2020. Yes, yes. yes. Um, and specifically hyper-focused on making sure black folks and mm -hmm. brown folks understand the impact of not participating. Right. Exactly. And for us, when we say black folks and brown folks, we're really talking about the Pan-African diaspora um, because, and it's going to show up really interestingly as it pertains to race on the census, um, whether you are from the Dominican Republic, Jamaica, Trinidad, um, Ghana, Nigeria, Alabama, Brooklyn, you are all included under that flag that Marcus Garvey was talking about when he talked about the Pan-African community. And all of us have a very, very, very um, high risk at not showing up on the census because traditionally we do not for a whole host of reasons. And when we don't show up on the census, we are essentially locking our communities into being underfunded and under politically represented for decades at a time. And so it's a major issue. So I want to start right there because I have filled out the census ever since I can remember. Excellent. Um, Before it it would say African American on there. I would literally cross it out and I would write in black. Yeah. Just because, and I've done it multiple times with a Sharpie. Um, <laughs> but I never, I still don't understand how that affects money coming into a specific zip code. Right. So it works like this. The entire, every single dollar that we get from the government, whether it's for SNAP, WIC, affordable housing programs, college preparation programs, subways, hospital beds, schools, librarians in the schools, um, teachers, everything that you can think of is basically funded based on these formulas that are determined by census count. So what happens is every 10 years, the federal government counts every single person, regardless of your citizenship. They count every single person in the country. And in your community, they take that total population count for your community, and they just feed it into the formulas. It's very non-emotional. It's very just mathematic. They feed those for, those population counts into these formulas. And at the end of that formula comes, this community has this many people, so they get this much money for SNAP. They get this much money for WIC. They get this much money for affordable housing and every single one of those programs. What traditionally happens is communities of African descent do not show up on the census. And we can talk about why in just a moment. But because we don't fill out the census, because we have a lot of fears about the census, our population counts end up being artificially small. So at the end of those formulas, we end up getting far less money than we're entitled to. If you think about it in terms of school, let's say we live in a mythical nation called Wakandaville. And in Wakandaville, we have 100 children who live in 100 families. And according to the federal formulas for census for school funding, that community should get $100 in school funding for all of that community to be serviced. But if only 40 of those families fill out the census, that means instead of giving, getting $100 for school funding, that community is only going to get $40 for school funding. But what happens in September is all 100 of those children show up to school, but they're only going to get education services that are appropriately budgeted for the amount of 40. So when you think about how, what that looks like, in terms of college preparation programs, in terms of hospitals and healthcare, senior citizen centers. If your community is only showing up on the census at 40%, you're literally getting 40 cents on the dollar. What's doubly worse about that is those formulas last for a 10-year period. So if in 2010, you did not fill out the census and your community did not fill out the census, we're literally still dealing with the lack of funding based on the 20 cents. And then it's formulas. compounded because those things impact you behaviorally, with your health, Absolutely. your mental health, all of these things. Absolutely. And so you can have, be a, a five-year-old that's now 15. You can Boom. be a 10-year-old that's now 20 and trying to figure your life out, and it's all because your schools didn't have the proper funding. They were funding. underfunded, understaffed, whatever it may From be. From kindergarten, elementary, middle school, and high school. So in theory, is what you're saying um, based more on community 
and location, but it affects people of color the most? Well, because we live in hyper-segregated communities. Right. So, so those- yes. So, yes to both of those things. And so, if you live in a community like Bedford-Stuyvesant or Brownsville or Harlem, you are literally living around people who very much look like you, who share the same fears that you do about government and about participating in something like the census. And as a result, traditionally, year over year over year, we end up being underfunded. So, for example, if you're living in my community, you might walk four or five blocks before you can find a trash can, right? Before you can, so you literally, if you're trying to keep your community clean, you got to hold on to whatever trash you have in your hand for four or five blocks before you can find a place to properly dispose of it. Whereas if I go to Park Slope, which is a very white community, which has, and white communities tend to have over-representation on the census, and we can talk about why in a moment, you might find a trash can on every single corner of every single intersection. Mm -hmm. So literally the physical infrastructure for maintaining the cleanliness of your community is underfunded in such a way that it compounds the lack of resources that we already have. On the Upper West Side, if I get to a corner and there's no trash can, I'm appalled. Yes. It's shocking. Yes. It's like, no, it's, it's, uh, and usually it comes back. It's like, oh, there's something going on. Right. And then the next day you see it there again. Exactly. It's crazy because I've definitely, I see the difference. I used, I lived in Harlem for over 15 years. Yeah. Now I live downtown. And it's, I had to go through that exact thing. I had to hold on to trash when I'm out in the street because I couldn't find it. Yes, what most people don't away. do. Hold on to trash. Exactly. They just let go yeah. of it. So let's well, get into, oh, sorry, Laura. No, I was, no, no, yeah, yeah. Let's get into some of the misconceptions that people have, some of the fears around the census because a lot of people are like, I don't want to give my information. That's course, personal, blah, blah, yeah, blah. And the other, and the other reasons why people are not doing it or overdoing it. Well, now with them. the ice thing. Boom. Okay, so we just celebrated 2019, which is the 400-year commemoration of the introduction of enslaving of Afri- enslavement of Africans into this country, right? And we're actually kind of 100 years off because our Latinx brothers and sisters experienced that. They began experiencing that over 100 years before we did. The first enslaved Africans arrived in Hispaniola, which is now Dominican Republic, Haiti, like in the early 1500s, right? So the first time strangers who don't look like us come knocking at our doors asking for information, you open that door, your entire village that night might end up on the bottom of a slave ship. Well, that's why black people answer the door the way they do now. Oh, who is it? There you go. <laughs> oh, is, oh, is that why... <laughs> who is it? Is that why black people get so sensitive about playing on the phone? Don't play on my don't phone. Don't play on the phone. Yeah, and if someone shows up at your door and you did not know they were coming, shh. Be quiet. We're not answering the door, and I don't want anybody knowing that we're here. So right. I remember even as a child, my mother being like, who? Like, no, be quiet. Turn off the TV. Well, like, My dad used to scream at listen. the door like he was about to shoot through it. Listen. And white people were like, hello? <laughs> <laughs> Come on in. Who is it? Come on in. <laughs> Yeah, that's right, crazy though, right. how deep that goes back. Well, yeah, and but if you think about it, that trauma doesn't end. So like, even throughout the course of enslavement, like anyone coming to your door, your your loved one might be stolen away. And even after slavery, you fit a description. Or we all saw, you know, Claudine, where, you know, a man living in the house might mean that you don't get access to social services. So the ability to disrupt who is in the house based on information By is By the way, historical. everybody hasn't seen Claudine. And did I just date myself? I think I just no, dated myself. A, you didn't date yourself, but B, <laughs> people don't even remember that that was a, a movie. Wow. So, yeah, so basically, like... In the early 1900s and, you know, going into up until the civil rights movement, your ability to get access to social services like food stamps, like health care, was contingent on whether or not you had two adults in the house. So if you had a man in the house who might be under or unemployed, they basically would be able to come into your house, investigate who was there and determine whether or not you were going to get access to those. Now, mind you, joblessness, getting a job as a black man, even trying to figure it out. So you could be like just like right now, you could be employed. Right. And not gainfully employed. Correct. Right. So imagine what that was at the turn of the century America. Sharecropping. Mm. Things like that where people are trying to just figure out how to survive. Right. So they're working and they're spending time and time doing it, but they're not making enough So black men were high. Exactly. So that the mom could get a little extra because he couldn't make extra. Right. right. And it wasn't enough. Right. Never was enough. And so having our, our families disrupted and interrupted by the state is something that we're used to. And so hiding from the census is sort of the natural outgrowth of that. But what that means is because we don't understand how these systems work and how our communities are funded, which makes sense. We only got the right to register to vote without being lynched for it, like in 1965. So if you know somebody who's like 56 or older, they're, they're literally older than integration. And it didn't stop there. It didn't stop there. Um, so now we have compounded issues with ICE, right? We have people who are intentionally coming into our communities. We have policing practice. We're stopping frisk. Okay, yeah, it's d- diminished, but we're still seeing racial disparities where black and brown people are intens- intens- intentionally targeted by actors of the state in ways that make us hiding from the census. It actually makes a whole lot of sense. It's self-preservation. What we have to do now, though, is as opposed to being really disempowered by that history, we have to use that history to inform how we move forward so we can be more sophisticated about how we engage and how we funnel resources into our community. So we at the Center for Law and Social Justice, which is a law center based at Medgar Evers College, it was, uh, we started in 1986 explicitly to deal with issues of African descent communities here in the city of New York. Uh, we created the New York City Black Leadership Advisory Coalition for Census 2020, which is a pan-African coalition that is literally having this conversation with every single organization we can get in touch with, every single person of African descent that we can um, encounter to 
really, one, educate the community, distribute information and materials so that they can become the trusted voices in the community and really ensure that people are going to be prepared for this version of the census, which is actually going to be a very different version of the census than so we've what's, seen before. So what's on it that's yeah, different? different? So, well, this time, for the first time, it's digital, right? So as okay. opposed to getting a paper form in your mailbox, Did what you're going that. to get is a postcard. And that postcard is going to have a unique identification number on it. And you'll be able to take that identification number and literally go online, go on your phone, on your desktop, and fill out the census. It's 10 questions, 10 minutes that literally determines the funding and political allocation for the next 10 but years. But it has to come from this postcard. It will come from the postcard. Or, in addition to the postcard, you can also call in your information now. So as opposed to going online, because, you know, if you're like my grandmother, may she rest in peace, the last thing you're going to do is put any information in on the Internet. No. Um, but you can pick up the phone and you can call in the information. And if you don't do either of those things, in, by April, you're going to rec- you will receive a paper form in the mail. So you have three options, basically. The online option, the phone option, or the paper option. Now, what happens is if you don't pick any of those three options, then that's when they send enumerators to your home. Enumerators are census employees who basically their job is to figure out how many people live in this home so that they can get as accurate a count as possible. But what that means is you ain't opening strangers the door. knocking at the door. Right. So mm-hmm. if I'm an enumerator and I come to your door and you don't answer, I might ask, you know, Joe Schmo out on the street, hey, do you know who lives here? And they'd be like, might be like, yeah, there's one or two people who live there. Meanwhile, it's you, your cousins, your aunt. <clears throat> three children and two grandparents or elders who need access to services but because you didn't take one of the three options ahead of time to fill out the census you basically are cutting yourself out of political fun- political well, and power also and too for the people out there that are willing to fill out uh what is it called like IQ surveys mm-hmm. and put in all your behavior on the internet or like photos on Facebook but you're afraid to actually fill out this information you're playing yourself right or you they shop already it on have Amazon. your behavior your zip code well, where you shop you, if you've shopped on Amazon they have your zip code exactly if you've done any sort of liking of your friends whatever they know who you are and who your friends are if you post photos of your children guess what they know you got well, kids well not only if they that you're to. also giving your information to businesses who want to make money off of you, right. foreign governments who we've learned we, we should not be trusting with our information. Right. And this is actually something that could help you. Right. And because in addition to money, it also determines how many political representatives that you get. So go back to that example of Wakandaville. If you have a family, a community of 100 people, and according to the census formulas, those types of communities should have 10 legislators assigned to them, but only 40 of your families filled it out, you're only going to get four, which means when you're fighting bail reform, when you're fighting stop and frisk, when you're fighting for affordable housing, you're literally short six of the votes that you would be entitled to. But guess what? The other town, let's call it, I don't know, Honkyville. Oh. They have... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> no, that's a, let's say another community that's mm-hmm. different like than yours right. has a hundred. Crackerville too. Lynchville. I've seen Lynch, there's, a, there's literally a Lynchville. Lynchburg. 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 Right. There's plenty right, of right, those. Right, right, so, right. so that community has a hundred and they're and they're fully involved in the census. Well, now they have 10 representatives to your four. So forget getting across uh, electing the official or getting across the legislation that you care about when the other views are going to be more represented. And Lynchburg actually is probably going to have 100 plus because Lynchburg tends to overrepresent. So what does overrepresenting mean? How does so that happen? Let's imagine we have a... a Liars. Th- <laughs> why would you lie though? No, well, but they well, count everyone. Because you're a liar. Do we and have to do this census- again? Why would you lie? Because <laughs> you're a liar and you've lied forever? But why would you lie about a census? census? Per household so because you know person? you're going to get more money. Both. Who knows, Ebro? Now, now I think All you're right. overstating. Now you're overstating, I think, the evil in this. You think the regular average person's like... The same way I think that people in uh, communities of color are uninformed about the census, I would imagine a lot of what I've never heard a word about the census in my entire life. But there's a different I feel like people are just nerdy and diligent about doing it and right. don't mind doing it. Right. No, but Ebro's point is they're like, let's get extra representatives. Yes. I don't. Who's doing that? Well, it's a different Liars. cultural relationship, right? <laughs> so just like I said, that 400 year history of, of African American people and African descendant people participating in the census is based on fear of government. In white communities, the fear is not there. Correct. Because white communities know that when the government passed the Homestead Act, like in the 17 and 1800s, after they cleared the entire West of Native American people, indigenous people, they basically told white families, hey, go out West. You can have five acres. You can set up a house. You can set up a farm. We're going to turn you into landowners and homeowners overnight. This is like the first instance of affirmative action. And so they know that when grandpa came back from the war, he got to use all his GI benefits. He got to use all his veteran affairs benefits. So the relationship between white communities and government is such that it is one that we will happily or more freely give over information because we are clear that when we give over information, good things come to us. So the historical and the cultural relationship is very different. But in that Lynchburg community, not only are mom and dad going to count all of the children because they're not going to worry about the children who they're taking care of who may not actually be theirs, who they do or do not claim on taxes. They're going to count all of the grandparents because they're not worried about having to convince grandma and grandpa about being included. They're going to count all the uncles, all the aunties. They're going to pick up the phone and call Junior and Juniorette who's away at college and remind them to fill out the census. And then, oh, we have a summer home. I'm going to 
make sure that I'm also counted in my summer home because I am clear that when I participate, benefits come to me. Forgot and about so the summer home hustle. Forgot about the summer home. So but that whereas, would be for a different community. So you're being counted in two communities. And making mm. sure that your privilege and power follow you wherever to so which you may go. Wow. Yeah. It's deep, see? Yeah. That's Larry. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is this is big talk. I mean, I've never had talk. a sense sense of talk like this. And I would think though, well, you guys were looking at me sideways because I've been talking. Wait, I've been talking on the radio for how, what the census. Yo, the census is coming, man. We got to talk about the census, census, census. Well, I would still argue that I the, uh, that the biggest disparity just comes down to the basic lack of trust from one community yeah. and over trust from another community. I'm not saying there aren't other people in this category you just described, mm-hmm. but I think the probably the predominant thing is that white people are just like, oh sure, I don't care, right. yeah, for all. sure. But yeah. it's the same thing happens with radio ratings. Mm. Yes, correct. We, Same we have- thing happens with any type of survey. Mm. Any type of survey adversely affects the communities that we speak to the most, which is why it's harder for our ratings to be as high as they possibly And it possibly- all comes mm. down to stop playing on my phone. Who would have thought that? Wow. We made it, We did a bit once on the air of uh, prank calling random black people to see how they would respond Ooh. to a prank phone call. <laughs> Every time it's bad. Well, we even have the listeners <laughs> participate. Yo, if you have a family member that gets that super angry right. when you call them and you're the wrong person, give us that. And we wouldn't so even we do anything. All we would basically do is be like, hello, is so and so there? Wrong person. Right. And just to see how mad people would get. <laughs> I had no idea the level of sort of the cultural thing that it's actually speaking to. Yeah. Yeah. There are, there are historical reasons for everything. Although that we I would do. think as a result that there would be white um, descendants of immigrants mm-hmm. from other countries, Jews, for example, who would also be hesitant about government involvement because of the history of their family going back was one of when the government comes yeah, to the but door. but it's been easier for Jews to hide, too, though, sometimes. Because you can't just look at a Jew and go, oh, you're Jewish, unless, of course, you're a stereotypical, you yeah, know, the physical, physical representation of but it. But what right. we do find in New York City is that Orthodox Jews and they're, people, they're they, they tend to also be undercounted on the census. So when we're looking at the groups who are the least counted, the least counted, African-descendant men and black children under the age of five and Orthodox Jews and Jewish members who are That's why Orthodox Jews are out here making their own ambulances and shit. Man. Well, but and see the difference is when you're able to be self empowered, you, you can don't... ameliorate a lot of the harm. When you are not, then you're dealing with con- traditionally underfunded communities. How do and, the how do the Latino communities do? So it's interesting. They, they also are tend to be undercounted. And what's going to be very interesting on this census is that the racial categorization has, shows up in a very different way than it oh, has traditionally. So. so usually what happens is when it gets to the category about black, um, people will often hit other. They will often write in nationalities. Like, so my family, my mother's family is from Jamaica. So they would write in Jamaican if they're filling it out. They would write in Nigerian, write in Ghanaian, and they would not check a race. And if you look at some of the racial categories, it will suggest for white Egyptian or some of the North African countries because race is a very funky, weird little mm-hmm. construct and it really varies country by country. Um, so when I Oh, and let's add in when you came to America, you did not want to be associated with the former slaves. So whatever right. category they y'all call them, we don't want to be in that box. Right. Mm. Even if we might look like them. Right. Black is a very American way of thinking about race, right? So there was a period when I lived in the Dominican Republic and I was studying the role of race in Latin American culture. And I would introduce myself as a black American when the question was asked. And they were like, no, 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 no. You're India. And I was like, mm. No, I'm not India. I'm really in black. Like, <laughs> that's okay. Um, but the reality is you can go into a whole host of uh, Latinx communities or Latinx countries, and there might be 13, 14, 20 different ways of identifying racially or colorly, I guess is the word, um, but without referencing blackness, right? And so when we think about that, that's significant because less than 5%, less than 10% of the enslaved Africans came to the United States of America. The vast majority went to Spanish and Portuguese speaking countries. Um, So when we talk about the Pan-African diaspora, it's predominantly outside of the U.S. that we're talking about. Um, And so in Latinx communities, as in many even African-American communities, the word black is very political. So there are some black Americans I know who are like, no, I'm African-American or I'm Afro-American. They do not embrace the term black. However, the challenge is that Dominican, Nigerian, Puerto Rican, Ghanaian, Trinidadian, those are not protected racial categories. So on the census, if all you do is identifying as a nationality, you are essentially removing your community from the protections that come See, with the racial See, black people been trying to tell y'all to ride with us. <laughs> y'all want to come in and act like you're something else. We told you it was black. They're going to think you black. You black. So what we tell people is, listen, the census is not the place for you to have this internal struggle about how you identify, right? Like if you are Dominican, but you are constantly mistaken as a black American. If you are Nigerian, and you are always seen as a black American because phenotypically your exterior looks black, how we would define it in this country. This is not the place to have some internal dialogue about how I'm really not black. I'm this, that, or the other. Listen, when it comes to policing, when it comes to healthcare, when it comes to the You're issues black. that matter, you are black. Sickle cell infects black communities, pan- 
Pan African, uh, prostate cancer, hypertension, diabetes impacts black communities regardless of nationality. So, right the first time on the 2020 census, you won't have to choose. African descended communities will be able to do both, right, in nationality and indicate race, which is significant because what we're saying is listen, Right in Dominican, right in Ghanaian, right in, right, your take your 23 your and read down, me. Your culture, all put that. your nation down, do whatever you got to do. Your Yoruba, boom, put it down. But on the next question for race, you have got to check black. Because when it, if I'm the Center for Disease Control and I have money for sickle cell, I have money for prostate cancer, diseases that are ravaging African American uh, and men of African descent, and you don't put that down, you're not getting my research dollars. You're not going to get my medical dollars. You're not going to get any of my investments. If it comes to education programs, and yes, we understand that there are distinctions between black and brown communities, but we basically live in the same spaces and we suffer from the same issues. If you are not racially identified, And use the same hair care products and boom, the barbers. The there hairstyles it is. is the same. Let's keep it on it. There it if is. If you go to the same barber with black folks, you're black. Well, right. there's, one, there's one group that we know has different hairstyles than everyone else, particularly beard. That would be Dominicans. They deserve their own box. <laughs> Dominican barbershop, different ball game altogether. Mustache game, way different. <laughs> I'm not touching that. <laughs> um, so yeah, so we just have to be way more sophisticated as people so, of color dealing with these issues. If 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 uh, if race doesn't matter, which we know that it does, in mm-hmm. how you know um, the government deals with us, because you see this politicized, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. Identity politics. Why is it still on the census? Why is it? culture and nationality the leading conversation why is race still there so to get a question changed on the census requires an inordinate an inordinate amount of time energy and activism in fact the trump y'all's president tried to put in a citizenship question on the census yeah, and we fought that in court and we were a part of the team that my my office represented the new york state black puerto rican hispanic legislative caucus as a miki in that case and that case went up to the supreme court and a number of folks the naacp legal defense fund aclu were fighting this issue across the country and that actually that question has been removed from the census because they did not even follow their own procedures in trying to get it inserted. To have that level of activism around changing questions on the census requires a lot of energy that most people are not organized enough to put in. And then we have to think about how race shows up in this country. So we don't typically deal with people based on culture. We deal with people based on race. We have cult- we have protections that are afforded based on race. America has a very weird and I would not even say good, but a very weird way of dealing with its racial history. And so having well, these boxes... Well, it's because race is in the history. Race is, Jim race Crow is, is the in the history. history. Exactly. Your complexion is in the history. Yeah. Your your appearance is a part of how they dealt with you in history. Exactly. Back it's the, to foundation, the Homestead it's Act. It's the foundation of the country, too. Right. Right. Absolutely. So I think what we have to ask is, as opposed to how come these questions or other questions aren't on the census, how do we take what we have and make it work for us? How do we make sure that we are engaged? We need the hip hop community to be talking about this, and particularly because we are all afraid of filling out this information. We need people to recognize that come March 12th, when those postcards start hitting your mailbox, pick up your phone, dial it in. Type it in, do whatever you have to do. How much bread y'all got? We can get these rappers if y'all Listen, give, give, give me a budget. We'll go ahead and get these rappers. They'll well, talk I about have senses. zero bread, but what I do Damn. have is love for black people. <laughs> so what I need our community to recognize is that basically ain't nobody coming to save us, right? And so all the issues that we have are compounded by having, we're talking almost $700 billion every single year is distributed based on these mm-hmm. formulas. So when we don't show up, we literally leave money on the table that other communities get to scoop up. We leave political representation on the table that other communities get to scoop up. So we are, it's like we're going into battle with two hands and one leg tied behind our back. So you don't work for the government? No. No. Um, Sorry, did I, I didn't say, but before, say that. <laughs> well, no, but the reason I say that is because we have been asked to have Griff who? From the census? Oh, um, this is the director of the New York census. I, I Jeff Baylor? Him. It's a female. I have to find her name. Okay. A woman. But the reason, I wanted to make sure you came first so that we had a more granular uh, ethnically specific conversation because yeah. I got to imagine that when they come in from the government, it's going to be a much more right. broad, right? Broad, generic, right? We really need black and Latinos to participate, convo, right. but not getting into the, the history, who, what, and when, and why of exactly. it. Exactly. Right? Daniel, the field director. Oh, okay. So she's worked with the city of New York, and she, yeah, so she will have that. She will have that. Kathleen wonderful, Daniel. Yeah, she'll have that conversation, and it will be very uh, government appropriate. Got it. Mm-hmm. Um, you watch Super Tuesday. You've been paying attention yeah. to the landscape. You're yeah. very vocal on social media mm-hmm. with regard to uh, progressive ideas. Mm-hmm. Are, 
Are you a Bernie Elizabeth Warren? No, I was actually a very strong. I've wanted Elizabeth Warren to run for office since she created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau before she was even any any elected position. I had a feeling that her her approach to issues, she's very smart. I feel like she's one of the smartest candidates that they have. She has a racial justice analysis um, that centers not just equity, but racial justice equity. Um, So I was sad to see the outcome yesterday, but I recognize that People of African descent are voting in ways that they think are going to produce the best outcomes. And quite frankly, we do not trust uh, white Americans to vote in a way that's going to benefit. Well, based on how white women show and men showed up for Trump. The stats don't lie. So um, we all he's a big uh, Warren endorser. He went out Yay. and said you officially endorsed Warren. Well, but- I did it too late. I should have done it a month ago, but uh, I, it took me a while to get there. I, I loved her the whole time. Yeah. Didn't know she was for me till a few days ago. And I was like, no, no, it's her. Right. And I didn't really realize it was going to be so over so fast. I thought she could really last longer. I I thought she would last Is she done? Is confusing. it official? No, but... but practically, right? It's not looking so So, and we all think she's the smartest, yeah. planned, detailed, whatever, but, but we always woman, knew it would be a challenge because of sexism right. in America, exactly. right? Exactly, exactly. Um, and, you know, I like Bernie. Um, I'm not... I'm a registered independent, so mm-hmm. I kind of kick back and wait for people to figure it out, and then I'm cool, because I think it's all shenanigans at that level, mm. uh, oftentimes. I'm more of a proponent of local right. voting and participating. Got it. But um, why, why so much love for Biden? I don't think it was... In Southern America. Well, one, I think you had the endorsement of several key figures who have civil rights history credibility that was going to sway people who were already leaning that way. Clyburn in South Carolina. I mean, he, him coming out, I think that was like raising Lazarus from the dead. Like, he was able to endorse Biden at a time that I think a lot of people were questioning. But I think that what we're seeing is that, overwhelmingly, we already knew older African Americans were not going to be veering too far away from the Biden category. Um, and he has a lot of history there. Um, I think that people were voting because they knew that if a progressive, were, if Elizabeth Warren did get, go forward, if a Bernie did go forward. There are not enough white people who are willing to risk that. Um, I think we were voting, our communities basically were voting based on, listen, what is realistic, what's going to cause the least harm, and what's going to put us as close as we need to removing the current occupant of the White House. So they went so it's an interesting thought, too, because we've been talking about progressives and, and, and how we feel, but you know, and, and a lot of people feel, and I think you feel this way to some extent, that to not go forward is to go backwards. And mm-hmm. to and to try to just go back to Joe Biden to normalize things mm-hmm. is not real progress. But being but being uber progressive, let's be honest, there's a lot of privilege in that too. There is. Being like, no, I want to change the world now. It's like there are a lot of people who are just like, we need this to end yeah. and get our feet settled. And I think you're probably right. A lot of people felt that. Anyone else, these other white people are not going to go out now, and support Bernie honest. and will get lost. And so Bernie, Biden's the safest bet. He can grab those people and yeah. maybe we'll it's have a st- It's far mm-hmm. from over. And Bernie won California and Colorado. Right. Right? Right. Um, you know, I, I keep reminding people that, you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. I know Florida's up for grabs and people are concerned because you got to win that. But is there a scenario where a president can get to the White House without winning Florida, but picking up Wisconsin, Michigan, California, Pennsylvania. If you get the rest of them. Yeah, no. If you get all you those other clear ones. clear sweep. Yeah, if you, get, if you get Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, you'll be fine. But I think at the end of the day, whether you are progressive or you were just enticed by progressive ideas, what's really going to be incumbent upon our communities to do is to engage in the on the ground work. Right. So it's not just about the presidency, although the presidency is significant, because, as I've said before, presidents pick judges and they install those judges for a lifetime. of And positions. right now, if you don't get Trump up out of there, he's about to we, could be we got Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the <laughs> other liberal who are very, very old. Right. And Sonia Sotomayor cannot be there by herself. Yeah. Um, I well, pray it'll be a 7-2 them, swing. Basically. We can literally be reinterpreted back into slavery. I don't know why people are not clear about this. Like, judicial interpretations are significant. But in addition to that, we also need to make sure that the Senate and people are actively engaged in who their senators are, who their their uh, their House of Representatives uh, are, and, and what their local government looks like. So here in the state of New York, we have recognized that we don't have, for example, the Voting Rights Act anymore or essentially uh, has been gutted by the Supreme Court. Um, but on the state level, there is legislation now pending to have a state voting rights act. And so we have to be way more engaged on the ground level in a way that doesn't just say I voted and that's it, but recognizing that the vote is like maybe step seven of a 10-step process of going from an issue to a solution to having that solution implemented. And the vote really is important, but I feel like sometimes we put so much energy in focusing on that that we forget the rest of civic engagement. We need people to be attending your local school board meetings, attending your local 
city council meetings, making sure that when people in Albany or your state capital are about to vote on something, that you are organizing your community, not just to be reactionary, but to have you know your own solutions and say, no, this is what we want. We oftentimes will say, well, what's your black agenda or what's your Latino agenda? No, here's the agenda that we came up with and we are hiring you to implement that agenda. So we have to really switch the way we engage with elected officials. We often have a... Um, here's what we need you to do when we right. give you this job. Here are the five things on our list, only one of which but is not negotiable. A lot of people don't even realize that that's what they're doing when they're voting. Right. They but don't they're... even realize that they're giving someone a job. Right. But it's also complicated because there are other groups who also are hiring that same person for the job. Yeah. And thus we have Barack Obama's presidency and most people's mm -hmm. presidency of... Here, here, he's not the black president. He's the president. Right. And he's got to look out for you, and he's got to look out for you, and he's got to do the best he can. But there are communities who, under Barack Obama, were able to effectuate their agenda. So if you look at the LGBT community, for mm. example, they had an agenda. They did not say, what are you going to do for us? They said, here is what you're going to do for us. And they were able to go down several items and on their list some of them. and got some of them. Right. Many in the African descendant community, because, again, we just got the right to register to vote in 1965 so without facing bodily harm. All the way there. But it's not there yet. It's coming. And so I think that as we engage more, as we have a lot more progressive groups, that we have a lot more groups that are thinking about how to be more um, critical about our elected officials and not see them so much as like like pastors. We often have this deification of elected officials. And so as we see them more, it's like, no, this is a job and here are the positions, here are the items that we need you to fulfill. I think we'll be able to accomplish a whole lot more. And I'm hoping that we don't, um, should Biden get the nomination and should he ascend to the presidency, I'm really hoping that black people will be able to overcome the Obama-itis that we were kind of under. And there was sort of this, you know, it was like black camera a lot. It was beautiful. It was like him, Michelle, the girls. It was amazing. And nobody wanted to be critical in the first term because he had to get a second term. And then during the second term, he didn't have the House. So he didn't have the, the legislative capacity to really do anything. And most of what he did has been effectively undone. So I think that we, we've been there. We've done that. We've learned a lot of things. And now I'm hoping that regardless of who ascends into that position, we are going to be organized such that here are our agenda items. We can crowdsource them. We got social media in ways we didn't before. We can mm -hmm. collaborate in ways we didn't before. And we're before. paying attention. And people we're are paying, paying attention. attention. And we recognize a lot more what's at risk. A lot of people, let's be real. Most young people's political interests started the day Barack Obama became a serious candidate. Yeah. So now there's more experience. There's people have been paying attention. By the way, um, Florida's 29 delegates. Um, uh, Michigan and Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania's 20, 16 mm. in Michigan. So like, if you do pick up everything, you could you could get through. It just requires it's other a, It would be a lot. It would be a lot. To not get Florida in, that would, that would thing, be a lot. You know, for Bernie at this level, look, whoever's a Democratic candidate, that's what I'm voting for. Yeah. I'm comfortable with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. I. You know. I. I know that America as a whole, the whole picture, is not on the same page. Right. Like we're just not. We live different lifestyles. It's just a whole different thing. Um. I. I think there needs to be a candidate like Bernie that shakes the table, but has the right support system to actually help him get things done. Right. Because I feel like young people who want to believe in the process and believe in the idea of making sure that the little guy, the hardworking person, the union person can actually get taken care of. And somebody who, in theory, fights against the billionaires and yeah. fight. I think that's essential in a lot of people who will never be a billionaire, don't see themselves that way, right. don't even see themselves as being a millionaire and hate the whole idea. They need that to continue to participate. There's going to be a lot of people who are young that if Bernie's not the del if Bernie's not the candidate, they're going to be apathetic. They're just going to be like, All well, right. we saw that last time. But yeah. that's exactly the wrong thing to do, and I think that that undermines what because it's not about Bernie; it's about what he stood for, right. right? So if you believe in Medicare for all or medical coverage for all, whatever you want to call it, then we need you to be active in every single one of those spaces Absolutely. that I just mentioned and pushing that agenda. If you believe that, so what you're alone saying be is Bernie may not get through, but so his pivot, plan could pivot, right? And make sure you're doing it on the ground. Exactly. Because you can force Biden, to, if should Biden be the nominee, and I'm almost speaking presumptively as if he is, but you could force whoever that person is to the left. That's what the Tea Party did, right? They came in, they were organized, and yes, they had funding, but they were organized in a way that they pushed their representatives so far to the right that there was no out. And that's how you ended up with a Trump. And they did it through businesses, too. They that's did it right. through protesting and attacking people. Because remember, Biden is... A politician. Yeah. I think he's a good man generally. Mm -hmm. I don't think he's incredibly, I think he believes in sort of basic American philosophies. Mm -hmm. And I trust him in that regard a million times more than our current president yeah. who doesn't care about America at all. But 
you can get Biden further left. You can. We have to do that. Right. And, and 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 let's be honest, Bernie and Warren have already done that to some degree. You That's could true. hear in Biden's language last night yeah. that he is a different candidate in the way he addresses a room right. than how he did a couple of years ago. And if we lose Bernie or Warren or one of the more progressives that we may be more in love with, right. we can still have an effect on making Biden an effective president Absolutely. for us. So if you look at student loans, for example, part of the reason that people can't discharge their student loans in bankruptcy right now is because of Biden, right? Um, but if you were to say, listen, we are willing I think to you vote have to for say you. that again louder. Yeah. So part of the reason that b- people cannot discharge their student loan debt in bankruptcy is because of legislation that Biden was a part of. The reason that we have Clarence Thomas on the Supreme Court is because of people like Biden. So th- the crime bill. But, so, I mean, there are things that we can look to that say, mm, this is very mm. problematic. However, we now have had an, a progressive awakening such that people are very clear. I want my student loan debt canceled. I want affordable housing. I think Medicare for everybody is a human right. And so being able to say, listen, Biden, if you are going to be the nominee, here are all the things that we need to see happen, and we are going to push you forward, not just you, but we want every single candidate who's on the ballot to adopt a progressive agenda. It may have to come in a form we don't like, but the agenda can still be accomplished if the people stay organized and activated. Well said. Uh, Larie Daniels favor, uh, R- Larie Daniel favors is her name. Um, we talked about black on the census. Um, when do these things show up in our mailboxes? March 12th is when the first postcards are going to start hitting mailboxes, which means you have to check your mail. And I know because I represented people of African descent that we often don't check our mail, which is how we miss summonses and we miss a whole lot of other things. Can you You skip the mail and just go online and do it? You can go online and you can look up your information based on your address. Um... However, we must be clear that the census has been severely underfunded to the extent that it's operating on a budget that was less than what they had to work with in 2010. That is intentional. That's and they want it to president. be broken. They want it to be broken because it is in the benefit. There are a lot of people who do not want black and brown communities showing up on the census. It is to their well, benefit. Which the same way they don't want them to vote, which is why in Texas exactly. they're waiting seven hours to vote. Yeah, exactly. Let's about voter suppression really quickly because I've seen more and more articles and people actually exposing it. I mean, we've seen it over and yeah. over and yeah. over again. Yeah. Right? What can we do? So, about voter suppression besides, like, voicing our opinions on social media. Well, and that's a great start, but it really is just sort of uh, screaming into the void on some level. I'd mentioned earlier that we no longer have the Voting Rights Act the way that we had, the 1965 Voting Rights Act. And the last election we had was the first election that did not have the protections of a Voting Rights Act. So if we'd had the Voting Rights Act in place, all of the poll changes and closures that we see happening in Texas would have had to have been approved and cleared by the Department of Justice. That didn't happen because the Supreme Court gutted that power. So what we're doing in New York is making is fighting for a state vote. Voting Rights Act because voter suppression is real and if I can keep you from voting that's one of the best ways of ensuring that like the poll tax it's, it's like the, it's better than a poll tax it's better than a literacy test um, so we need people who are thinking about these things to be asking your elected officials on the local level what are we going to do about voting rights in this country how is it or in this state um, how are we going to ensure that you can't just move my poll site 10 days before the election and I don't know about it so I'm going to the school that I've been voting at for the past 50, 11 years and you moved it to some place that's far across town how do we um, when we just meet with your elected officials, ask them where do they stand on a state voting rights act. You can look at states like California, you can look at states like Washington, which have already passed them, and mirror that language and think about implementing that in your own state. But what I'm talking about really is us having a way higher level of political engagement than we're typically accustomed to. And I think we often approach government in this country almost like a monarchy, like a kingship. Like, well, we elected somebody, go handle it. That is not how this thing works. We are the, so if you get a job, your boss doesn't hire you and just say, go work. They are constantly monitoring you, they're evaluating you, they're if you're messing up, they're checking you, they're pulling you into the office, having conversations with you. That's what our role as elected, as voters is supposed to be on our elected officials. So when your poll sites are closing, get you, your friends, your girlfriends, your mom and them, head down to the, your local elected official. Hello, what are you doing about this? In fact, we know what we want you to do about this because in the state of New York, in the state of California, in the state of Washington, this is what they did. This is what they're doing. So we want to make sure that we have a voting rights act that's going to protect us. We don't want voter suppression. It should not be that we are waiting 15, 20, 30, 40 hours to stand in line to cast our vote. That is suppression. That is diluting our vote. So here's what we want you to do about it. Um, it's often easier to complain than it is to organize. Mm-hmm. But we need people to shift out of that mindset. We have got to organize. Otherwise, we are going to be trumped on out of our positions, on out of power, and on out of our communities. Or like I always say, play around if y'all want to. My bank account's going to be good, but, you know. Again, that probably doesn't disaster. help her, but that's not the message you can have <laughs> in her position. It doesn't work. I'm going to be good. No, it doesn't help. <laughs> Yo, Larie, I love you. Love you back. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. That was Thank great. You guys. Look for it in the mail. Census 2020.